Hey everybody, it's Stephanie Old World Gamer, and welcome back to Depression Quest. Um, yeah, uh, last time we um, basically we, we were doing good with the whole therapy and medication, and now we're lying awake in bed worrying about our relationship with Alex uh, in regards to keeping a secret and feeling like that you're going to lose her if you tell her something else that's wrong with you. So, we're basically going to go through the trouble now of actually, um, I think, uh, telling her about uh, the situation. So, let's tell her about the situation. You feel like a jerk for accidentally waking her up, but you're afraid if you put this off any longer that you won't find the strength to tell her everything later. No, actually, everything isn't okay. Can I tell you something? Something important? Alex sits up, sits up, rubbing the sleep out of her eyes. For the rest of the night, you lay side by side, holding hands, as you tell her everything. You tell her how it's more than just feeling sad sometimes, how you feel trapped by your own mind sometimes, and sometimes you feel nothing at all, and how you can't shake it off. You tell her how you've started going to therapy and how you feel embarrassed about it, and how it's working out for you. She listens the entire time, occasionally asking questions about how this, how this or that works, or asking you to explain something further. She squeezes your hand and tells you she understands, and that she's sad you didn't tell her sooner. After laying silent for a moment, the weight of what you did hits you. You desperately want her to say something, to tell you how she's feeling about all of this, but you're too afraid of what the answer would be to ask. You start convincing yourself that now that she, she knows everything, she's going to leave. There's no way someone can deal with how you really are. How can I help? What do you need me to do? She asks. You think for a second and the answer you come up with fills you with despair. I honestly don't know. I wish I knew how to fix this, but I don't know what you can do and I don't know that you can do anything. I think it's something I just have to live with. She looks at you with sad eyes before kissing you on the forehead. Then I'll live with it with you. I don't know how you could possibly love me. She rolls over and wraps her arms around your neck, settling her head on top of yours. You don't need to. Just know that you, I do. It's a Friday night and you're laying across your bed feeling pathetic. As you were leaving work tonight, a group of co-workers asked if you wanted to join them for drinks. Feeling antisocial and put on the spot, you declined. You have a habit of doing this. You're often so convinced you're weird and terrible that in any invitation to hang out will end in disappointment for those inviting you. You never feel like you know how to act in group outings. <coughs> and you feel like a total creep since it seems to come so naturally to anyone who isn't you. You find yourself petrified of breaking some unknown social rule that you don't often go out. <coughs> now, however, you find yourself alone at home. Your brain has begun telling you how pathetic and sad you are for being unable to just be a normal person and go out with nice people. You can't figure out why you can't just go out and meet people and enjoy yourself. At the same time, you're also feeling like no one would possibly want you to hang out if they really knew you, because you're dull and weird anyway. Try your typical strategy to boot up Netflix to distract yourself from those feelings, but frustration with yourself builds. And you realize you have to do something else with your night. Anything else to take your mind off of how, how awful and lonely you feel right now. What do you do? Okay, so our options are see if Attic is online, call Alex, drink, or go out somewhere alone. Oh, and apparently our status has changed for everything, so let's have a look here. Um, you are definitely still depressed, but things are getting better. Whatever you're doing seems to be working. You f really feel like you're taking steps to affect a uh, positive change in your life. You now seem to enjoy seeing your therapist. Between giving you a chance to talk things out and the CBT technique she shares with you, you find your session sessions extremely helpful. You've been taking your medication regularly, and while you were skeptical at first, it's hard to argue with the fact that you're feeling better than you have in a long time. Makes me wonder if seeing a therapist... I don't know. That's something I've always been skeptical about. 
But anyways, um, let's see. Um, I don't want to see if Addict's online. I want to see what Alex is doing. She, I mean, you got to spend more time with the girlfriend, right? Especially after that, you know, heartfelt conversation you had at night. So, uh, you dial Alex's phone number, figuring that if you could spend some time with her instead of being cooped up in your apartment alone, you might feel less isolated. Her phone rings. Her phone rings a handful of times before giving a going to voicemail. You know it's not uncommon for her to be out with her friends at this hour. You leave a voicemail, but end up calling again 15 minutes later, still no response. You imagine Alex out with her friends, much like you would be tonight if you weren't so horrible at socializing. Your mind wanders, and you start to wonder who she's with, and if she might meet someone tonight she'd rather be with. Someone who is able to go to parties with her, like, uh, like... Someone who is able to go to parties like this with her instead of singing at home, feeling sorry for themselves. Why didn't she invite you? Have you... Have you just said no too many times? How many other Fridays have you unknowingly missed? You begin to think that maybe it would be better if she met someone tonight. She's a wonderful woman. You feel like a constant kill jo a joy kill uh, on nights like this. Why can't you just be normal? The next morning, Alex calls you back. She tells you that she left her phone in class. It's been a boring night in her apartment, too. You feel horribly embarrassed about how emotionally you've gotten over mistaken assumptions the night before. <sighs> it's a cold Saturday afternoon. You just arrived at Alex's apartment, and, you, and you're happy to finally see her after a week of absence due to your schedules not lining up due to work and school. You hug her in the doorway, but she breaks away sooner than normal and sits down on the couch as you take off your sneakers and lay them in the usual place right next to hers. There's something I was hoping we could talk about, actually, she says. You're suddenly worried that you're being blindsided by a breakup conversation Due to a sudden shift in tone, that's the same way I felt actually when I read it. <laughs> but she quickly smiles and puts you at ease once she sees all the color leave your face. It's nothing bad, I promise. With that, she leads you over to the couch and sits on the other end of it facing you. So, I hope this doesn't freak you out. But if you feel like things are going too fast, just tell me. She talks faster than usual and fidgets. We seem to have a lot of weeks like this and they really suck. I was thinking I'd ask since things are so strong with us. What are your thoughts of maybe moving in together? Takes a few seconds to sink in and leaves you in a bit of shock when it does. You were worried she wanted to spend less time with you, not more. What, what, do you want to, you ask? Well, yeah, I do. I mean, we had to sort out logistics and everything, but those are all things we can take care of. You start to walk through the steps of imagining the two of you living together. You love the thought of being able to wake up next to her every day and seeing her so often. However, the more you picture it, the more a few concerns become apparent. There are things she is uh, insulated from, like the days you don't feel like you can even get out of bed, the nights your medication keeps you from being able to sleep, all those moments you're stuck staring at the wall, completely out of energy and feeling nothing. How would, you, how would she handle that? How quickly would she want to get away? So, she starts, what do you think? Okay, so you can tell her you want to, but have concerns and discuss them honestly, which is probably the best way to do it. Tell her you don't think it's a good idea for you right now. Decide to move in regardless of your worries. Let's talk to her. Why not? She seems to be pretty open to talking, so... Sorry. <laughs> um, you are really worried that if Alex were to live with you, she wouldn't be able to deal with the day, your days of being unable to get out of bed or nights where you can do nothing but stare at the wall and panic. Even though you've discussed your situation with her, you still fear she doesn't realize the depths of how bad it gets. It's one thing for you to detail how you feel sometimes, but for her to see it pop up occasionally, it's an entirely different situation for it to be something she has to live with, live with alongside you. Well, I'd like to, but I think it's best if we talk about it a bit more before committing to the decision. Though she seems a little defeated, you make it clear that you not making excuses actually mean that you want to talk. You reiterate a lot of what you've told Alex that night. And although she gets a little defensive, she tells you that she knows all of that already. She confir confirms that she's willing to help you sort through your issues. I feel like you forget I love you sometimes. You know, I know that there will be days, and I'd rather try to work through them with you. We can figure out all this together. Her words sway you, and you can't help but hold her close to you. Yeah, man. <laughs> oh, 
It's December and you've returned to your parents' house to celebrate the holidays with your family. At the living room window you see a gentle flurry of snow drifting down to meet the pristine blanket of white from yesterday's unexpected Christmas Eve snowfall, and you quietly laugh to yourself at how incredibly cliché it seems. Still, as you sit down to dinner you can't help but notice how being surrounded by family in the overly kitschy kitschy atmosphere? Uh, I don't know that word either. <laughs> Overly kitschy atmosphere your mom's decorations have created have actually made you feel relaxed and almost comfortable. Your mom is running around frantically, checking the oven and the stockings, just generally trying to family time it up, while your dad sits at the head of the table drinking a beer and laughing with your brother Malcolm. His wife Karen is there too, whom you've always gotten along with. As you thoughtfully munch away at your turkey, listening to conversations around you, your thoughts shift back over the last few months. Think about how hard things have had gotten, replaying over in your head some of the worst, as well as some of your best, memories. Now it seems like all these things just come to a head over the past few months and with a sudden flurry of relationship turmoil and professional anxiety, social stress and all above social stress and above all an omnipresent sense of weight that it seems you have just recently become aware of. You're drawn out of your you're drawn out of your reverie by your dad's familiar booming laugh as some cheesy comment Malcolm made seems to hit its mark. Sitting at the table, you're suddenly immensely glad for the chance to be able to ignore everything for an evening and not have to struggle trying to explain yourself for once. Fortunately, everyone seems to be content with laughing at each other's jokes and discussing favorite sports teams. For a while, you think you'll be able to get through dinner without any embarrassing personal intrusions. But no sooner did the thought cross your mind then the table conversation trickles off, leaving a slightly awkward silence to descend upon the dinner. <coughs> <coughs> so, how are you doing these days, your mom asks you pointedly. Uh, it's such a simple question, and well, and, and such a simple question, and that one, and that you, oh my god, and one that you see, and one that you seem to have had the answer countless times recently. You take a moment to collect your thoughts, then looking up, you take a deep breath. Well, you've never really thought of yourself as a fighter, and even to say it now, it sounds hokey, but looking back in the past few months to where you are now, it really does feel like you've endured an immense struggle, and you look at where you are now with the sense of something that isn't quite pride. You still hate your job and find it unpleasant, but, you, but you're surprised to find that going into work every day is no longer a mental challenge monumental challenge. You started adopting some clever techniques like taking short two minute breaks every hour to break out the monotony and now you view your job as just eight short hours of your day. A, compartment oh, a compartmentalization technique Dr. Melville told you about that you found actually works quite well. You know this job isn't what you want to do for the rest of your life and you started actively looking for other positions even attending a couple of preliminary interviews. You started, take, started making an effort to go out with your friends more while the social scene still makes you very uncomfortable sometimes. You're more and more able to let yourself just enjoy the company of your friends. In fact, your relationship with many of them has increased over the past little while. You still definitely have days where you flake out or don't feel up to hanging out, but for the most part your friends are understanding and appreciate your communication. By far the biggest change you've noticed in your life has been in your relationship with Alex. You were terrified of talking to her about everything at first. But looking back, you feel like it's only strengthened your relationship. She was always supportive of you emotionally, but lately the two of you have been even more in sync, and it's really starting to feel like you're building a life together. It even seems like two of you have been making a more concerted effort to sync up your schedules and have been spending more and more of your downtime with each other. Pretty soon you think moving in together may be a very real possibility. Dr. Melville commented on how well you seem to be doing and whether a result of therapy, the medication, or both, you can't help but agree. With all that seems to have improved recently, it's, it's sometimes difficult for you to think about the fact that you still have bad days, sometimes even really bad days. They serve as a stark reminder of the fact that this will be something you likely have to deal with for, your, for the rest of your life. Depression is a battle, and though, you've certainly, and though you're certainly ahead in the fight, you know the battle isn't ever going to be over. Sometimes even Alex can tell when things are going rough, despite your best efforts to the contrary. While you know that your depression can never be cured, 
You have a very strong support network in your friends and even Malcolm, and armed with a newfound confidence in your friends and family, you accept the tough road. The tough... You accept that though the road may be rocky, it is a very least... It is, it is at very least not solitary. You meet your mom's gaze from across the table and muster up a smile. I'm good, mom, you tell her. She says nothing, but can feel her, you can feel her smile from across the room. Wow. We really want to thank you for taking the time to play Depression Quest. We realize it may not be the most enjoyable game you've ever played, or even the easiest. We sincerely appreciate your involvement. Like Depression itself, Depression Quest does not have an end, really. There's no neat resolution to Depression, and it was important f to us that Depression Quest's own resolution reflect that. Instead of a tidy evening, we want to just provide a series of outlooks to take moving forward. After all, that's all we can really do with depression. Just keep moving forward, and at the end of the day, it's our outlook and support from people just like you that makes all the difference in the world. Thanks again. Um... I gotta say, um... I enjoyed the game. Uh, it, like I said, it really hit home for me quite a bit. Um, it, it makes me rethink of how I'm living my life and about getting back on medication, possibly going to see a therapist. Because, I mean, in, in the end, that's all we all want, really, is to have a better life and to be happy with everything that we're doing. And sometimes it's not that easy. And I mean, if it takes medication and a therapist to be able to do that, then maybe that's the choice that people have to make. Well, I hope that somebody um, took something out of this um, playthrough. Uh, I'm going to also be doing this game for the Indie Source, uh, just because of the fact that of what it's trying to do, and how it's trying to help other people realize that if you have depression, you're not the you're not out there alone. A lot of people feel the same things, and a lot of people do and, and fall back onto the same things. Um, there's a lot of nights that we spend watching TV, eating junk food, and just not doing anything, not being any productive or whatsoever. And I mean, like I said, it, like it, this game really spoke to me emotionally as well. So, um, Zoe Quinn, the writer, and Patrick Lindsay is also a writer. Both of you guys did an excellent job. Um, I, I can I, I can see a, you know uh, why you did this, and I, I think it was a good job. I think you guys done a great job on presenting this, and I think it's something that people should be made more aware of. That how many people in the world actually have depression and stuff, and that it, they shouldn't feel bad about getting help. Because like I said, I, I'm one of those people, and. For the longest time, I didn't want to do medication, and then I did do the medication, and then I stopped. And just like the game said, it still ends poorly, because you don't keep doing it. And, um, I gotta say, uh, congratulations on making a, in my opinion, a well-made game, and something that people should, you know, look to. I know a lot of people may look at this and say that it's stupid, or that it's... You know, it's text-based, so, you know, this is a waste of my time. I'm not going to listen. I'm not going to watch. But that's the thing. You can be working on an art project and just have this playing in the background. And at the very least, then you can, you know, hear, you know, how, how people feel about the, the content of it itself. So, uh, I don't know, and I honestly highly doubt that Zoe Quinn or Patrick Lindsay or anyone else involved in this game will actually... Um, watch this playthrough or the review that I'm going to do for it, but I hope they do because uh, I, I do appreciate it. I really do. And um, I'm just going to check to make sure there's, there's nothing else there. Just going to scan through the credits so that people can pause if there's anyone there that, that deserve to get help or that deserve to get credit, they should get it. Why not? Uh, Terrence Wiggins for his help with trailer ideas, blanket forts, and depression valentines. See? <laughs> Barton Mother Self for being the internet friend one of us need to get through some dark times. And you for being willing to play the games that are meant to be something other than simply fun. As always, thank you all for watching. I'm Stephanie Old World Gamer, and I'll see you guys soon for a new game. <laughs> see ya.